Greetings, happy warriors, and welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, am solemnly dedicated to revealing for you how the world, yes, how the world really works. Thank you for being tuned in to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. We are going to go back in history a little bit to um, the uh, the eighties, about nineteen eighty four, five, six, yeah, that that area, and um, there was a wonderful man who was very influential in America, particularly in terms of conservative politics. Uh, his name was William F. Buckley, and uh, I was privileged to know him. Uh, we met originally by both having been on a program uh, speaking for a certain event, and uh, and we were talking afterwards because we share a love of sailing, and uh, he was just leaving or had just come back from a big sailing trip. And uh, he said, well, let's stay in touch by MCI Mail. I was fascinated because I had not met anybody else who knew what MCI Mail was. Turns out it was the very first email system. I was enchanted with this because I know that anything that makes it easier for human beings to connect with one another is hugely important in social and particularly in economic terms. And so you can actually watch the meteoric escalation in economic productivity when steamships, for instance, dramatically shorten the distance between Europe and America. Uh, you can see what happens. Again, meteoric peaks in economic productivity when the telephone becomes normal and accepted and common and popular. You can see the same thing when uh, television penetrates American homes. So anything that allows us to connect more easily with one another is hugely significant. And so I was very much on top of this development. So MCI was a communications company that, um, and again, the, the internet was very, very uh, raw and unrefined at this point. But MCI um, came up with the very first email system. And again, the internet, as we know it, the web didn't really become real until about 2000 or so. Here we are 15 years earlier than that, 1985. And um, there weren't that many people on it. You had to actually be a subscriber to use it. And uh, William F. Buckley, who was the founder and the editor of National Review magazine, um, he was also a close personal friend of President Ronald Reagan, who uh, was in the presidency at this point from 1980 to 1988. And, um, and so it was about 85 or 86 that, that we connected. And it was about the same time that I began um, watching Firing Line. And then later on through YouTube, I was able to go back and see earlier Editions. Okay, now wait, hold everything. Have you already subscribed to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show? If not, you know I ask you this every week. So if you are a new listener, well, then you have a reason to not know about it. But if you're anybody else, please do make sure. Um, for the benefit of all the relevant and important parties to this transaction, just go ahead and subscribe to the show. And uh, furthermore, you might be thinking about whether or not to start your next learning journey with the Scrolling Through Scripture online course. That is one of the uh, things, the one, one of the resources that we've created about which I am most thrilled. Well, now is a really good time, because if you purchase Scrolling Through Scripture Genesis Unit 1 or Genesis Bundle Units 1 and 2, you receive our Thought Tools book set, which is three soft-covered books, by the way, absolutely free. 
It's nearly $50 value uh, plus free shipping. The books will be shipped directly to addresses within the U.S. international uh, zone, uh, within the U.S., sorry, is what I mean to say, but customers outside the U.S. will receive ebook versions via email. So if you want to learn more about scrolling through Scripture, uh, you might want to listen to a free lesson, which you can actually do by going to rabbidaniellappin.com and then going to uh, look for Scrolling Through Scripture, and then you'll look for the free lesson and you'll enjoy it. Um, I don't think, in fact, I know there is absolutely nowhere else you will be able to gain an insight into the first 31 verses of the Bible in a way that strips aside all the kindergarten level descriptions and all the elementary school translations and reveals it to be what it really is, which is a thrilling matrix of the comprehensive nature of life on this planet. So uh, that's called scrolling through scripture. And uh, I think you will find that to be very, very exciting. And I hope so at any rate. So go ahead and subscribe and also uh, take a look at scrolling through scripture. That would be wonderful if you can do that. Okay, so uh, let us move on with the show. William F. Buckley came up with this idea of a sort of talk show format on television. I believe it was Nash, uh, was, I think it might have been PBS that carried it. I'm not 100% sure. But um, at any rate, he uh, used to have a weekly show where he would interview and converse in depth with people, people with whom he agreed, people with whom he disagreed. And it, to this day, it remains a fascinating show. Uh, William F. Buckley was an immensely likable guy, even to those um, with whom he disagreed dramatically on politics and economics and and on religion. He was a serious Catholic. And uh, so at any rate, we, we certainly got on very well. And I, uh, as I say, I went back and listened and watched all the episodes of Firing Line. One of the most interesting was filmed in 1966 with who? With a man called Hugh Hefner, who was the creator of something called Playboy magazine. Now, Hefner had begun Playboy magazine 13 years earlier in 1953. So it was well underway already. And uh, every issue each month carried not only the the famous pictures of nude ladies, but it also uh, carried something that Hefner wrote called the Playboy Philosophy. And it was exactly on the Playboy Philosophy that William F. Buckley wanted to converse with Hugh Hefner on the show Firing Line. And uh, it was uh, absolutely fascinating. So what what happened is, and I mean, just to give you some some quotes, um, uh, Hugh Hefner sort of said, "Look, the Playboy philosophy is an anti-Puritanism, a response to the Puritan part of our culture." Um, and so then uh, Buckley took him on on whether he rejects not just the Puritan part of our culture, but um, mosaic law, as he put it. Uh, so again, to quote William F. Buckley from the transcript, I'm not worrying about whether you reject Cotton Mather's accretions on the mosaic law, but whether you reject the mosaic law itself. Do you reject, for instance, monogamy? Do you reject the notion of sexual continence before marriage? Hugh Hefter says, well, I think what it really comes down to is an attempt to establish a new morality. And I really think that's what the American sexual revolution is really all about. It's an attempt to replace the old legalism. It's certainly not a rejection of monogamy as such, but very much an attempt. In the case of premarital sex, there really hasn't been any moral code in the past, except simply, thou shalt not. 
and William F. Buckley interjected and said, well, that's a code, isn't it? And Hefner said, well, perhaps, but I don't think it's a very realistic one. And so it continued. Now, to me, what's so interesting about listening or watching this discussion between these two men in 2024 is that in 1966, when it, the conversation actually took place on the air, uh, it was it was very early. And so um, one of the things William F. Buckley said to uh, Hugh Hefner, one of the ways he challenged him was he said, what credentials do you have to write a Playboy philosophy? You know, what are your credentials to to issue a rebuttal of conventional Judeo-Christian tradition in favor of the Playboy philosophy? And uh, I remember thinking, you know, that wasn't a really good challenge. Um, a better one, I think, and I hesitate because William F. Buckley was an absolutely brilliant man. He passed away in 2008, and, and the world felt a lonelier place when that happened. Uh, but he, um, he, he could have said, I think, look, we've had a chance to see centuries and centuries of society that has based its entire moral worldview on the Judeo-Christian Bible ethic. And so what do you think, you know, what do you think it might look like? What do you think society might look like after, shall we say, a hundred years um, of your philosophy? The Judeo-Christian based philosophy has resulted in Western civilization, and it's produced engineering and science and music and medicine and art and social institutions and governmental institutions and property rights. Um, what do you think society might look like after a hundred years of your philosophy? After all, again, this is what I wish that uh, William F. Buckley would have asked Hugh Hefner. Uh, marriage, traditional marriage, has served the function of channeling male sexual energy into productive and long-term satisfaction, which allowed the West uniquely to produce these advances in human living, which benefit the entire world today. I wish he would have asked that, but it was all very new. Don't forget the birth control pill was 1962, and this is 1966. Things are just beginning very early on to unravel. Well, 70 years have gone by, and um, we, got, we already have a pretty good idea. You know why? Because the truth is that regardless of who won the debate, and I, I don't think it was clear who did, but um, the the, the reality is that Hugh Hefner won the cultural debate. We are looking today at an America dramatically different from the America that existed in 1966. And so we now have a pretty good idea of what a society based on the Playboy philosophy actually looks like. You see, in order for human societies, for groups of people to be able to live together, certain conventions become accepted and uh, become widely practiced. And these usually revolve around, uh, first of all, male-female relationships, because it is so volatile and so incendiary and so capable of, of destroying a society, and also about uh, transactions, financial transactions. These are the kinds of things that, uh, that, that these conventions typically revolve around. And uh, in the natural order of things, each generation, in other words, as children grow up, they take their parents' standards in these areas as the starting point 
And then, as in the way of children since time immemorial, they liberalize them, they, uh, they challenge them, they struggle against them, and they invariably end up with uh, more palatable standards, if you like. And so the general direction of society is towards entropy and decay because it's very difficult and unlikely for a young generation to maintain or even increase the, the, the rigor of the previous generation standards. And so you're not surprised to discover sexual mores becoming more liberalized uh, and feelings about money tending towards envy, the natural entropic tendency towards wanting more for doing less. And this is, in short, the very pattern that removes cultures off the stage of world history. It generally takes about 10 generations, as I've spoken about in the past, to go from the strengths and standards and, uh, and rigors of the founding generations to the laxness and softness and, uh, and, and lack of strength of the 10th generation that basically escorts that society off the stage. In other words, the strength is given away, given away to, uh, to decadence, and that society is on the way out. And so, uh, you know, I sometimes hear people saying, well, look, you know, we came through World War I, and we came through World War II, and we came through a depression, and uh, we are survivors, Americas, you know, we're still going to make it. And um, <laughs> the answer is that it's not the same people. And a simple way to, to recognize this is that, first of all, something I've told you about before, which is that um, sexual uh, decay, sexual concupiscence, lack of restraint in the male-female arena or the sexual arena uh, increasingly less uh, standards, increasingly less self-discipline in those areas on a society-wide level invariably results in a less capable generation. And, uh, and that's true in, in almost every single area. And so we see that if you uh, go back to 1966, when the issue, the episode of Firing Line that I've been talking about, when that originally was was filmed, um, think about what the standards were on television. Think about what the standards were on the movies of the day. And any child, you could have a child watching television or, or watching the movies and uh, prime time television at that period in 66 would have been shows like Gilligan's Island, which ran, I think, from 64, 1964 to 67 or 68. So in 1966, we're right in the middle of the peak popularity. And this isn't just for kids. This is the family watched Gilligan's Island, 8 p.m., uh, you know, in the night. And... Uh, and whilst there were very faint hints at romantic possibilities, there was absolutely nothing overt, nothing that would have been embarrassing for parents to be sitting in the family living room and watching Gilligan's Island, even with their teenage kids. It was completely innocuous. Can I even use an old-fashioned word? It was pure. But um, 30 years go by, and from 66 to 96, or actually it was 94, when a sitcom appeared on American television called Friends. And Friends ran from about uh, 94 to about 2004, roughly 10 years, I think it ran. And, uh, and now you actually saw young people disconnected from their families and living alone and together. And we actually saw on television a normalizing 
of premarital physical relationships between men and women not married to each other. And yes, I know the tendency to this today is to say, yeah, that's perfectly normal, it's perfectly okay. But if we're interested in watching the roadmap, the timeline of the destruction of a society, you have to go back to see where it begins. And you have to see that in the absence of any injection of moral energy, that decline is going to happen automatically. What would be an example of an injection of moral energy that could prevent it? Well, the Judeo-Christian Bible-based system, which insists that every generation has to methodically and diligently teach these precepts to their children. And so in this society, uh, whether it was a Hebrew society of, of years ago or an American society more recently or a general a Christian society, parents took this seriously in a way that you will never find secular families in 2024 doing. But parents would teach these uh, chapters and verses to their children, and that would restart the entire moral calculus. And so it wasn't that children were then free to make their own moral decisions and to embark on their own slippery moral slide down from the standards of their parents, which they were able to dismiss as old-fashioned. And, um, and instead, you've got this moral injection of a biblical system being methodically and purposefully taught by parents to their children, and that made sure that children did not start sliding down front. They, they readopted and reaccepted exactly the same set of principles and precepts that their parents did from their grandparents. And so uh, American society, on that basis, from the time of the pilgrims uh, to, um, as I say, to probably around about 1960, and that's sort of loosely configured, uh, held together. And, and why it is that uh, to this very day, in Torah-committed Jewish families, you do not have in general, the sicknesses of general society. It's just, it isn't there. And um, it's only because each generation re-injects an infusion of moral energy in order to prevent the perfectly natural and the perfectly normal entropic tendency of decline, decay, and degeneracy, ultimately. So, um, so from 1966, which is still pretty much an America the way it used to be in terms of morality, we, as I said, I jumped 30 years to show a 10-year um, show called Friends from about 94 to about 2004. And that was, if you did that jump, or if, you know, if, if William F. Buckley could have shown a few clips from Friends to Hugh Hefner, that would have been a fast, I mean, obviously it couldn't happen, but Hugh Hefner would have been shocked. He absolutely would have, because he himself grew up in a Christian family, and he certainly did not speak in this interview of overturning conventional society and destroying value. No, he, he thought he was really helping, at least in the early stages of the Playboy philosophy. And so had they but been able to jump ahead 30 years to see a brilliantly scripted television show that made it so cool and so clever and so with it to be like those six young people living on the Upper West Side of New York, uh, it it had it had a powerful impact on society, and then Friends ended in about two thousand and four or two thousand somewhere like that, and then uh, came another show called Two and a Half Men, 
And uh, that ran for about another 10 years, approximately. And that picked up where friends left off with a level of crudity and vulgarity. But again, brilliantly written, hilariously laugh out loud funny, but in a way that left you feeling tarnished and a little bit dirty, laughing at the cleverness of the, of the dialogue, but realizing that you were laughing at something sort of pretty basically animalistic. The show reveled in jokes about bodily functions. Um, the, the show um, almost made the, the hero a, a stereotype of, of a man uh, caring very little for women in general, or even women in particular, as he used women. And it was kind of, a, in many ways, he was the result of the Playboy philosophy. But Hugh Hefner and William F. Buckley were not able to look ahead from 1966 to, shall we say, 2006, when uh, Two and a Half Men was capturing a huge number of American eyeballs on television. But that's what we saw happening, that kind of deterioration. So back in 1966 on William F. Buckley's firing line, Hugh Hefner is um, espousing his Playboy philosophy, and uh, William F. Buckley, I think, was finding it frustrating because he was sort of saying, you know, who are you to put forth a new philosophy to replace the Judeo-Christian Bible-based model? But um, Hugh Hefner was simply saying, look, you know, I'm, I'm suggesting ideas. I'm suggesting a new and I think improved way of looking at principles and values and standards uh, which no longer serve the modern human being. At, in general, look, if uh, somebody wants you to take their views as fact, go ahead and feel free to inquire as to their credentials. And you might ask whether they're willing to go on record like um, when Professor Paul Ehrlich of Stanford University, two years after this firing line in 1968, uh, wrote a very a book that became very popular called The Population Bomb. And he spoke about how within a few decades, Americans would be dying of starvation because there are too many people. The population bomb, you get the idea. And you might well have, have said, look, are you willing to go on record, Professor Ehrlich? And he would have said, I have. I've published in a book with my name on the cover. And, um, and you say to him, well, what gives you the right to do this? He says, well, you know, I'm a professor. Uh, and then it could, you know, stand or fall on its own merit in due course. Um, rising sea level. Okay, there's another one. All right, the sea level's all right. Now, this goes against everybody's, anyone who is near the coast or spends time near the water, it goes against every single thing. People can look at photographs of famous landmarks like the Little Mermaid statue or um, Alcatraz uh, on the island in San Francisco Bay or anywhere else. And you could take a look at pictures that are, you know, 50 years, 100 years old and see the water level and now see where the water level is now. And you see that people are plain and simply lying, right? You know, that's, that's all there is to it. They're just lying. As a matter of fact, um, as long ago as five years ago, at the beginning of 2019, the Atlantic magazine, which is by no means a conservative or right-wing magazine, um, ran a big story saying all the terrifying sea level predictions are looking far less likely. And, and they did this because it was obvious to anybody with eyes in their heads that um, it's just not coming true. These frightening predictions of how global warming is going to melt the glaciers. Oh, and even more, global warming is going to, ex as anything warm expands, the seawater is going to expand and it's going to start flooding coastal cities. And, um, and, and they, they were worried that people were going to dismiss everything 
as the work of complete cranks because anybody who actually took the trouble to look into it could tell <laughs> that the rising sea levels was was nonsense. It was it was a non-story. It just wasn't happening at all. And um, and so that's why they came out and they said, well, you know what the the the, the truth is uh, that you know what guess the uh, the Thwaites Glacier and the Pine Island Glacier. Well, they're not really melting as uh, as it seems as if they are. It runs through cycles. It gets uh, colder. It gets warmer. Nothing to worry about. Basically, everything is fine. It's not exactly what they said, but it's kind of more or less where it was going. But these kinds of statements where people ask you to take things on fact, fine. You know, you you can take make a record of it, and then you'll see whether they were right or they were wrong. Um, the um, uh, McKinsey, one of the biggest of the world's uh, business consulting firms, published three papers, one in 2015, one in 2018, and one maybe 2019 or, or 2020, um, re reporting about how if you practice diversity and inclusion and uh, what is it, and the DEI um, e e equality, uh, yeah, I, I don't always remember. Yeah, diversity and equality and inclusiveness. If you any company that practices it is going to benefit. It's going to have higher profits. Um, McKinsey and Company published that as I say several times. They issued three reports, and uh, they say, hey, you know, look, th this is amazing. It's you're doing the right thing. You know, you're bringing in people who are diverse, not on merit, but because of their color or because of any other political aspect, not because they're good at their job. Well, it's still going to pay off. Well, guess what? Uh, Econ Journal Watch went back and examined all the studies of McKinsey consulting, and they saw that these actually was four studies, 2015, 2018, 2020, and 23, all claiming the same thing. Oh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, all of this is going to uh, really increase the profits. Not true. <laughs> it's simply not true. Our results indicated that despite the imprimatur often given to McKinsey's studies, the studies neither conceptually in terms of the correct definition of causality nor empirically in terms of their set of large U.S. public firms support the argument that large U.S. public firms can expect on average to deliver improved financial performance if they increase the racial ethnic diversity of their businesses. Yeah, it's, it's, it's simply not true. But so it is with facts. However, when people are discussing ideas, it's kind of different because ideas are a lot like bullets. What do I mean by that? With a bullet, all that matters, if, if somebody's pulling a trigger and shooting something at you, a bullet, really all you want to know is whether it is a foam dart fired from a Nerf gun that toy kids play with. Or is it a 357 Magnum round from a stainless steel revolver with a six inch barrel? That's all you really have to know. The person holding the gun and whose finger is on the trigger can be trained or untrained, licensed or unlicensed. It doesn't matter. We don't care whether he went to university and got a master's degree or whether he is an autodidact whose only graduation was from kindergarten. That is how ideas are. You have to confront them regardless of the person articulating them. It doesn't matter who's pulling the trigger. You just have to worry about what kind of bullet it is. You don't have to worry about, you don't care about what sort of person is expressing the idea. You only have to worry about analyzing the idea for truth and validity or otherwise. So if somebody challenges you with a disturbing idea, 
Don't waste your time and energy trying to fend off the challenge by questioning the individual's credentials. And in reverse, never let people discredit your ideas by lazily labeling, labeling them as uh, you know, old-fashioned or sexist or retrogressive or capitalistic or racist or anti-Semitic and so on and so on and so on. Force them to engage and discuss the merit of the ideas. Don't let them disqualify ideas by labels. That's lazy and it's a lie. So I tell you all of that to tell you that about 10 years ago, a very interesting thing happened. I, a lot of interesting things happen all the time, but something that I found interesting, and I, I put it aside because I knew I was going to talk about it with you, and, and it's 10 years I've been uh, keeping this, and what happened was that a woman called Susan Patton wrote a letter that was published in the Princeton University magazine called The Daily Princetonian, and then she converted it into a short article that was carried in both the Wall Street Journal and Forbes magazine. Amazing. Let me tell you uh, a little bit about the piece. Uh, It appeared on February the 13th, 2014, in the Wall Street Journal, and it was entitled, A Little Valentine's Day Straight Talk. And... um, Uh, This is her talking to her daughter, who is a student at Princeton University, and to her daughter's friends. And here's what she says. I'm going to just read a little bit of her short article. Despite all the focus on professional advancement for most of you, the cornerstone of your future happiness will be the man you marry. But chances are that you haven't been investing nearly as much energy in planning for your personal happiness as you are planning for your next promotion at work. What are you waiting for? You're not getting any younger, but the competition for the men you would be interested in marrying most definitely is. Think about it. If you spend the first 10 years out of college focused entirely on building your career, when you finally get around to looking for a husband, you'll be in your 30s, competing with women in their 20s. That's not a competition in which you're likely to fare well. If you want to have children, your biological clock will be ticking loud enough to ward off any potential suitors. Don't let it get to that point. This is, uh, as I told you, a woman called Susan Patton writing in the Wall Street Journal in 2014. Continuing, you should be spending far more time planning for your husband than for your career, and you should start doing so much sooner than you think. This is especially the case if you are a woman with exceptionally good academic credentials aiming for corporate stardom. An extraordinary education is the greatest gift you can give yourself, but if you are a young woman who has had that blessing, the task of finding a life partner who shares your intellectual curiosity and potential for success is difficult. Those men who are as well-educated as you are often interested in younger, less challenging women. She doesn't say prettier, younger women. Could you marry a man who isn't your intellectual or professional equal? Sure, but the likelihood is that it'll be frustrating to be with someone who just can't he- keep up with you or your friends. And you'll have these, she said, you know, you're going to be having conversations and you're going to get this glazed look over your husband's face, which you're not going to like. And what about if you start earning more than he does? Forget about it. And she's right. At that point, the marriage is probably doomed. So what's a smart girl to do? Asks Susan Preston. Answer, start looking early and stop wasting time dating men who aren't good for you, bad boys, crazy guys, and married men. College is the best place to look for your mate. It's an environment teeming with like-minded, age-appropriate single men with whom you already share many things. You will never again have this concentration of exceptional men to choose from. When you find a good man, take it slow. Casual sex is irresistible to men. But the smart move is not to give it away. 
If you offer intimacy without commitment, the incentive to commit is eliminated. That grandmotherly message of yesterday is still true today. And then she goes on to say, look, it's not out of the question that you meet a terrific marriageable man after you leave college, but there's not that many of them. And once you leave college, you're three years older or four years older, and guys you might be looking at are looking at younger women. So realize the reality. That's what she's saying. You may not think you're ready for marriage in your early 20s, but keep in touch with the men that you meet in college, especially the super smart ones. They'll probably do very well for themselves, and their desirability will only increase after graduation. And then her last paragraph is, if you want marriage or motherhood, start listening to your gut and avoid falling for the politically correct feminist line that has misled so many young women for years. There is nothing incongruous about educated, ambitious women wanting to be wives and mothers. Don't let anyone tell you that these traditional roles are retrograde. They are perfectly natural and even wonderful. And if you fail to identify the one while you're in college, she says, well, you know, let's hope that you'll do so afterwards. Well, Forbes magazine got inundated, more so than the Wall Street Journal. The protests were such that Forbes magazine did something they almost never do. They issued an apology for publishing Susan Preston's article. And I'm pretty sure you can no longer see it on the Forbes website. I think. But what, what you can see on the Forbes website is an article um, entitled, I graduated from Princeton and I married a Princeton man. And uh, she writes, this is a young woman, I've hemmed and hawed over whether to post about Susan Patton's now infamous letter in the Daily Princetonian on March the 29th. And um, and that was uh, of um, of 2013, actually. That's when it was 2013. And uh, uh, and let me just say right off, I don't agree with Susan Preston. Um, she says you you don't necessarily have to find a man in college. And she then proceeds to denigrate Susan Preston and to talk about uh, all the ways in which she's completely wrong. She says, here are the worst of um, Susan Patton's, did I say Susan Patton's article. She said, and now she quotes, and you just heard me read this as well. For most of you, the cornerstone of your future happiness will be inextricably linked to the man you marry, and you will never again have this concentration of worthy men. And now she says, to be out there telling a woman that her happiness will be inextricably linked to a man is the worst advice I've ever heard. This woman is clearly not a feminist. Oh, my God, can you believe it? Can you believe it? The woman who wrote the piece is not a feminist. I believe, says this girl, I believe that each woman's happiness is inextricably linked to the choices she makes and how she fulfills her career and her personal needs. <laughs> she says, I know plenty women who are 40 and not married, and they're very happy and very career-focused. Maybe they'll get married, maybe they won't, but they and I certainly do not see their happiness linked to a man. Um, and she goes on and on taking uh, sentences or phrases out of Susan, Press, Susan Patton's uh, article and then attacking them from the perspective of politically correct feminism. And... Um, this was so interesting. And I thought, you know, what a good debate for young women to be exposed to. Now, they've made it hard to find Susan Patton's original article, but it's out there. You can find it. And But there is no shortage of articles and, uh, and columns attacking every aspect of what she said. And again, the attacks are not on the merits of the ideas because there's not really much you can argue with about the very simple, straightforward ideas articulated by Susan Patton. And this woman, this young woman, argues against it um, 
on the base of, how can she say this? I know plenty. Of, and this girl is too dumb to understand that anecdotal stories do not constitute a rebuttal of an argument or of an idea. So <laughs> she's, she's not tackling the essence of the idea in the slightest. So, okay, fine. And, and really amazingly, um, in, in the years that followed the publication of the article about a girl's focus on getting married far more than you're focusing on your career because it will produce more durable, more important, more lasting happiness. So in the years, just so much criticism. I actually uh, found on the internet four easily, I mean, this wasn't a long search, I found four attacks on her article. Meanwhile, years have gone by, it's 10 years since then, and um, a young woman uh, called Grazie Sophia Christie writes a piece in The Cut, which is a, uh, a section of New York magazine. And the name of the article is The Case for Marrying an Older Woman. An age gap relationship can help. And uh, Grazie Sophia Christie then writes a piece, and I'm, I'm going to just pick out just a couple of sentences to give you the gist of it. Um, she starts off talking about uh, life with her husband. She's uh, been married for a few years. My husband is 10 years older than I am. I chose him on purpose, not by chance. As far as life decisions go on balance, I recommend it. When I was 20 and a junior at Harvard, a series of great ironies began to mock me. I could study, I could prove myself as much as I wanted, and still my biggest advantage remained so universal it deflated all my other plans. My youth, the newness of my face and body, compellingly, effortlessly, I shared it with the average idle young woman shrugging down the street. What she was saying, what she's saying was, that from the perspective of most men, the fact that she was working very hard on her career and her academics at Harvard was not as important as her youth and her looks. Okay, now, complain about it, but it's a reality, and, and that's what she says. So she says, I decided to go and study every Saturday in the Harvard Business School, and there I sat with about 50 of the planet's most suitable and eligible bachelors. And then she, um, she says, she speaks about her looks, and she says, uh, uh, you know, I, I was good looking, and uh, I have most of my eggs, and I even have plausible deni deniability when it comes to my purity, and I have a pep in my step. And, um, and she said, older guys still desire those things. And she said, I could never understand why my female classmates didn't join me. Uh, given their intelligence, she says they should have figured that. So in essence, the reason I'm putting these two stories together, separated by 10 years, one in Forbes and the Wall Street Journal, followed by a slew of attacking articles, and one in the New York magazine online, uh, The Cut. And she's basically saying exactly the same thing. And this young woman is saying, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to wait till I've devoted the next 10 years to my career and then hope to look to get married when I'm 30. And um, it's a very interesting piece. And she must have realized the attacks that she's going to get. Uh, when I think of same age, same stage relationships, what I tend to picture is a woman who's doing too much for too little. I'm 27 now, and much, she got married when she was 21. I'm 27 now, and most women my age have partners. These days, girls become partners quite young. A partner is supposed to be a modern answer to the oppression of marriage. The problem with a partner, however, is if you're equal in all things, you compromise in all things, and men are too skilled at taking. And she gives a list of how these men benefit from having girlfriends and how the girls lose out 
by being girlfriends, not wives. It, it's fascinating. I, you'd probably even find it interesting if I were to almost read the whole thing to you, but I, I'm not going to do that. Um, but um, needless to say, even though this only came out uh, a few weeks ago, it, it has already attracted uh, a great deal of angry protest. And I find that absolutely fascinating. So uh, there it is. Sophia Grazy has already aroused a angry firestorm of protest. I have not read a single substantive argument against what she says. Only steely anger. And the only thing I would say, if I were to talk with her, and by the way, I've actually tried to locate her uh, to have her as a guest. I'd love to talk to her on this show. But uh, one of the things I'd say to her is, look, you surely know, as well as I do, that you're not really so much focusing on an older husband because, you know, you were 21 or 22. He was 32 when you got married. You know, a 10-year gap, not huge. But what you really are saying is not older, but wealthier. And, um, and, and that's a reality. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Uh, one of the incontrovertible nice little pieces she has in there, and I'm, I'm going to um, share this with my wife, Susan, uh, this evening at dinner, and I, I think that she and I would both say exactly the same thing. Here's what Gracie Sophia said. She says, last week, my husband and I looked back at old photos, and we agreed that we'd given each other our respective best years. Sometimes real equality is not so obvious. Sometimes it takes turns. Sometimes it takes almost a decade to reveal itself. And that's what she says. She says the ultimate equality is that we both feel that we've both given one another our best at our best years. And uh, yes, women do try to make men focus on becoming more financially successful. Why? Well, because women are looking for a man who is more financially capable than they are. That's ideally what women are looking for. And when a woman finds herself married to a man who may have shown promise, but it didn't pan out, or a woman who wasn't wise enough to know that a man's financial ambition and prospects really matter, and don't waste time even dating men who don't fit that, doesn't mean he's got to have money, then he's got to have prospects, got to have ambition. But women who find themselves married to men who do not manifest those masculine qualities of financial ambition end up feeling very often resentful and unhappy. And so um, is this a good thing or a bad thing? It, it's a good thing because if men are stimulated by women to try harder to make money, that's wonderful. You know why? Because unless they decide to become highwaymen or bandits or hold-up artists pointing guns at convenience store clerks, the only way they can make more money is by serving other human beings. Because unlike the government that can forcefully seize your money, the only way that a man can, can obtain your money is by offering you something that you value even more than the price of the thing he's asking you for. And you think about that, that's really what's happening every time there is a consensual, agreed transaction, right? If I hire a young woman to babysit my children, and I'm happy to pay her $35, $45, I'm happy because the freedom that she gives my wife and I for an evening is worth to us more than that. Nobody forced us to pay her. And so, so it is with all financial transactions. And so to be motivated by a woman to seek and strive harder, that's good for society. Samuel Johnson, the great English writer, wrote, and I'm quoting him here, there are few ways in which a man can be more innocently employed than in getting money. 
That's right. If somebody wants to become an environmental regulator, I'm, I'm not at all at ease about it. But if a young woman wants to start a company that is going to make a really, really useful piece of software, that's wonderful. That's terrific. I, I'll probably buy that software if it's in my field. That's great. If a person wants to become a climate activist, that's not going to be good. He's probably going to be gluing himself to the highway when I'm trying to get to work. No, when people, when men particularly, are focused on making money, that is the very best thing you can expect men to do and want men to do. You don't want men, well, I, I don't have to paint the picture for you. You can see yourself. What are the many ways in which men can start doing things that are not good for you, not good for society, not good for your neighborhood. That's the secret. That's what it's worthwhile understanding. Yeah, it's really important to know how the world really works, right? It really is. And to also understand that there are certain unchangeable realities. The reason that Shakespeare is seen as a great writer is because he writes about the lasting aspects of human nature, things that are true in uh, England 400 years ago, just as they are true in the United States in 2024. The reason Dostoevsky, the Russian novelist, was such a great writer is because he recognized the unchangeable realities about what it means to be a human being. And uh, you've got to realize that there are certain things that the left, that secularism, that uh, progressivism insists can be changed in people. Um, you know, I, I always remember an extraordinary piece I read about a, um, a couple who um, mistakenly were misled into believing that they could improve their marriage and you'll pardon me, I mean, this is absolutely horrible, but they could improve it by bringing in a third person into their marriage. Well, the whole thing about a marriage is the utter exclusivity of a husband and wife. But nonetheless, they decided that an open marriage with another person would work for them. And, um, and the man wrote later on, after the whole thing had exploded into a horrific mess, and lives were ruined, he wrote and he said, I really believe that I was a modern man and that I could overcome feelings of jealousy and I could liberate myself from these primitive caveman feelings. He says, but as much as I tried, whenever I knew my wife was with another man, he says, I started retching uncontrollably and throwing up all over the bathroom floor. Um, yeah, that's right because he was trying to violate how the world really works. And one of the ways the world really, really works is that it is very important for a man to be able to make money, much more important than it is for a woman, in terms of his intrinsic identity. And it is absolutely right and normal for a woman to look for a man who is more successful than she is. And it is absolutely right and normal for a man to seek the youngest and most beautiful woman that he can find. And that's not to say that it's, you know, it's wrong or it won't happen uh, for a man to marry a, a girl who's two or three years older than he is. Sure, I know many marriages like that. That's fine. Absolutely not a problem. But in general, that's what men are looking for. Men are not looking and shouldn't be looking to see how academically successful his future wife is or how much money she's making. No, we have a name for a man who looks to a woman for money. So uh, there it is, my dear friends. It's how the world really works. And uh, it was so interesting for me to listen to that discussion between Hugh Hefner and his Playboy philosophy 
and William F. Buckley, one of the most eloquent spokesmen ever for the Judeo-Christian Bible-based view of society. So until next week, I remain lovingly your rabbi and remind you to stay focused on your five Fs, work on building your family, your finances, your faith, your friendships, and yes, your fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.